and how we're going to be beyond the second millennium. We are on this journey to go into the next millennium. We've had greatness in the seventh century by way of the building of the largest Buddhist temple by the Shalendra dynasty. It took 75 years to build between 650 and 725. We've had another greatness in the context of the Majapahit Kingdom, which was really a regional economic and maritime architecture, which was recognized by the region in a big way. Then we kind of like slowed down for 700 years. And now we're back in the 21st century, where we might be seeing the new kind of greatness. I think we do. This is a lot of history, but I've got to catch a flight. <laughs> Shalendra Dynasty, a little piece of information. The guy, there was a guy by the name of Jinbun. Anybody know who Jinbun is? He was the Chinese name of Raden Patah, who was born in Damak, central Java, that actually laid the foundation for the founding of what is now known as the Mataram Kingdom, which became the great Islamic kingdom in central Java. And a number of the Wali Songos, the nine saints of Islam in Indonesia, are actually Chinese. Jinbun founded the Mataram dynasty. This speaks of the diversity and the richness of the diversity of this nation of 250 million people, which has had a good taste of peace and stability for 2,000 years. Why would I think that it's not going to continue? Absolutely not. If we've had relative peace and stability for 2,000 years by way of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, I deny and I defy anybody who thinks that Indonesia is likely to be shaken. Because the core of our soul is that of peace and stability and diversity. Which is why the thesis of Indonesia in the next 28 years until 2045 should be a pretty staggeringly interesting one. I highlighted this in the last year's presentation. The number has changed a bit. But what I want to highlight is our marginal productivity on a PPP basis, PPP adjusted basis, is at $23,000. That's the amount of goods and services the average Indonesian can produce vis-a-vis -vis Singapore at $125,000. So imagine a bilateral trade agreement between Singapore and Indonesia. Who do you think is going to win? The guy that's more marginally productive, right? But it's okay. You take the 20, 30 year view, there's no reason for us not to be able to ramp up the $23,000 of goods and services on average per person to a much larger number. We're only spending $8 on R&D per person per year. Singapore is spending $1,600. So anybody that's spending $1,600 per person per year on research and development, I think ought to be moving faster than the other guy that's only spending $8 per year per person. But it's okay. You just got to make sure that this guy tomorrow will have access to patient capital. That $8 is only going to move up as soon as fintech is going to come about, which is already. Middle class, 80 million in a couple of years' time. We're going to comprise about 43% of the population of ASEAN, of the GDP of ASEAN, and of the middle class of ASEAN. Indonesia is going to be a crucial part of the inertia of ASEAN. When ASEAN speaks with other members of the economic universe, 
We've taken a staggering number of people out of poverty. Go back to 1998, we had 130 million or more living with $2 a day or less. Can you imagine that? It was only 19 years ago that we had more than 130 million people living with $2 a day. Now, we only have 20 million. As of 2014, 21 million. But now we only have 20 million people living with $2 a day or less. You've taken 110 million people out of poverty. That's an amazing feat. It speaks of the momentum and the inertia that Indonesia is characterized with. We've got close to half a million kilometers of roads. Where do we want to be in 2045? We want to be at 2 million kilometers of roads. We're at 730 kilowatt hour per capita of electric consumption. We want to be at the 15 to 20,000 kilowatt hour. Singapore is already at close to 9,000 kilowatt hour per capita of electric consumption. If we want to be a developed country, we've got to be at the 15 to 20,000 kilowatt hour per capita of electric consumption. We're still at the 730. We're at the 36% of financial inclusion, rest assured. With lots of the conversations that we're seeing and hearing in the fintech space, that needle is going to move up to 50 and 60 in the next couple of years. That needle moved up by a couple of notches only in 10 years. In the last 10 years, it only moved up a few notches. But rest assured, by way of the conversations on technology, how people are going to be able to apply not only digital, but also machine learning and artificial intelligence, that needle is going to move up fast. And that guy in Wamena, in Pulo Samosir, in Toraja, those guys are not going to be able to access capital. Peer-to-peer -peer is going to be part of the conversation. A guy that needs money for $100 in Jimber is going to be able to f basically borrow from anybody in this room over the handphone at a cost that is so significantly lower than if he or she were to go to the bank. That's already happening in a big way in China. That's going to happen in this place. We have a great population. We have a great number of universities. We have a great number of university students. We just need to make sure that we get good quality of students. We get good quality of teachers. Here's the number. If we were to spend 20% of the government budget every year for the next 28 years, the future value of the educational spending by the Indonesian government, aside from the private sector, is $5 trillion. That's the future value of how much money is going to go into the educational space by the government. At 20% of the government budget, assuming only 12% tax ratio, that's the ratio of tax versus GDP. The typical OECD country is at about 33%. So if we were to sensitize that ratio, and the tax amnesty has done great in terms of increasing the tax ratio, if we were to sensitize that all the way to 25%, not even 33%, by the year 2045, we're going to be able to spend 10.5 trillion US dollars. Now with 5 trillion US dollars, we're going to be able to send 50 million people for a one-year high-quality education at the likes of Gajamada, Itebe, Cambridge, Oxford, MIT, Stanford, and all the Ivy League schools. It's game-changing. And that's happening already. We just got to make sure that the right number of people have the right kind of aptitude to go to these great universities. And we've just got to make sure that there is a proper allocation of resource in terms of how much goes for OPEX and how much goes for CAPEX. In some places, people don't know the difference between CAPEX and OPEX. But if they do, I think more spending on CAPEX and more smart spending on OPEX will definitely take us to the right place in terms of the educational space role for the future of Indonesia. Infrastructure. If we were to spend 5%, this year alone we're spending a staggering amount of 
money on infrastructure, $30 billion. It's close to 15% of the government budget. But if we were to just spend 5% per year going forward until the year 2045, we're going to have 1.3 trillion US dollars to build the bridges, the roads, the power plant, the port capabilities, and the airport capabilities. You think we can't go from 50,000 megawatts existing today to 1 million megawatts? Mathematically, it is doable. The money is there. And imagine if we were to be able to sensitize the tax ratio to a greater percentage, we're only going to be able to spend more money for things that are going to be good for the future of Indonesia and Indonesians. Disruption and dislocation I've talked about. Will the future technological disruption lead to a social inequity or equity? You have the answers. But I think what we've got to address, it's not just the Gini ratio. Our Gini ratio is at 40% already, which reflects upon the gap between the haves and the have-nots. But what doesn't get measured is the wealth gap. The wealth gap relates to the extent to which the oligarchs have an influence over policymaking. That is something that needs to be captured in the conversation. And that is something that needs to be captured in the way we want to shape the future of our country. Regulatory stickiness. If the regulatory oversight is sticky to the past, that's going to create a bit of a tension on how we want to change, how we want to move.